All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to delivering backends like frontends with WebAssembly. My name is Brooks Townsend. I'm a lead software engineer at Cosmonic, and I've been a CNCF Wasm Cloud maintainer since 2019, um, even before it was called Wasm Cloud. So I've been doing WebAssembly stuff on the back end for quite a few years now. Serial open source contributor. I love working with WebAssembly, especially anything that has to do with Rust, and I'm a demo enthusiast, of course, as you'll get to see today. So taking a look at what we're going to talk about, I want to go a little bit in the back end of like, what is a CDN? Like why people use them at all? Transfer that knowledge into network optimization for backend applications, diagrams, do some demos, do some more demos, look at some more diagrams, all that, all that good, good stuff. Try not to bore you too much in the post-launch hour. And then really get into like, what is all of this really good for? And where are we gonna go next with some kind of technology like this? So to start, I found this really awesome blog to define what is a content delivery network, which I trust Cloudflare with this kind of stuff. At its core, a CDN is a network of servers linked together with the goal of delivering content as quickly, cheaply, reliably, and securely as possible. In this blog, it talks about how a CDN is a distributed network of edge nodes that's caching static front-end content as close to the user as possible. But it does specifically call out that this isn't a replacement for web hosting in general. You still have to have some server somewhere that your assets are coming from, that you're running your backend. Ultimately, the data for your application has to live somewhere. Now, why do people use CDNs? First of all, they want their application to be quick, and they don't want to spend a lot of money on egress costs. These are two of the biggest things that people use CDNs for, and if you haven't used them explicitly on your own, you can compile your static assets and then package them in a CDN, and essentially what it looks like, sorry for all the people who want to see the memes, there's more, there's more, I promise. This is kind of like a high level architecture diagram of what happens when you're using a CDN. You've got your backend somewhere, we'll, we'll call it like US West, where it's you know, your Go, your Node.js, your Rust, whatever. Your, your backend and the hosting platform for your application is running in some central place. When a user makes a request to your website, whatever application you have, then say they're in Europe. That's gonna take a decent bit, even just for the static assets of your application, to transfer all the way from your server in, in the US over to Europe. You know, it's not gonna be anything huge. It'll probably be less than a second or two. But with a CDN, they, these platforms will offer these little edge nodes that you'll essentially pull through that place. And then the static assets for anyone else, say you're in Europe who makes a request to your website, will then pull from the edge node itself really minimizing the amount of data and the distance that it has to travel on a network. And that makes things load faster and it makes things cheaper. You're not paying for egress costs from the cloud like where your server is. And that's great. Like from a front end perspective, like that's perfect. My users are happier. The app developer is spending less money. And it kind of begs the question, the, the very you know, nuanced question, like, why can't I just distribute my backend everywhere? Like, what if I could just run the actual hosting part of my server on all of these different edge nodes? And like, what if I could cache that close to the user? And I don't need to care about like the deployment target because it's just a little static file, like whatever. I don't need to know what platform it's going on. So can we do this with backend compute? Nope. Thanks everyone, uh, and happy to answer any questions. I got like 30 minutes left, so a little time. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right, seriously, the, the answer is, of course, that it's way more complicated than that. Deploying backends, we have so many different, if you look at all the talks here at KubeCon, we're talking about a platform for deploying container-based services, like there's whole conferences for this stuff. It's hard, it's complicated. And if it was easy, of course, everybody would be doing it. And the reality is that you, can deploy your application to a bunch of different geolocated servers and design it specifically so that it's close to a couple of different users and so that the request hits that edge node instead of a central cluster and all of that. But this probably means that you're not using Kubernetes and you probably built your application to be like this from the beginning, which involves a ton of complexity. And the specific call out here around Kubernetes is running different clusters of Kubernetes in different regions, different clouds across a disparate number of edge nodes that could be added or removed at any time 
is at least prohibitively expensive, if not impossible to do. Let me know if you've done something like this with Kubernetes. But I wanna take a little bit of a step back and talk about why I'm even here talking to you today. The, the goal, like what I work on uh, on my day-to-day -day and why I've been working on, Cosmon or on, on Wasm Cloud for so long is I wanna be able to optimize these applications from a networking perspective to reduce the amount of data and the distance that it has to travel on a network. So many different applications that we have, and of course there's always exceptions, are bounded by the amount of time that it takes for packets to go from point A to point B, you know, from the user to the server. You can, you know, you can argue about like whether or not a Go or a Rust backend could serve 100,000 requests on a local host endpoint, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, the vast majority of the time that it takes for an application to give you a response to your request is just the time that it takes to get from that point. And so what I want for backends and what I want to continue this talk with is I want to be able to take my backend like any platform agnostic front end static asset and deploy it everywhere and get that type of network optimization. So the two main domains that I want to focus on for this talk, there's infinitely more, but just to simplify it, are the kind of hobby application, something that I write in my free time. It's providing a fun little web application uh, or something for my business that's not necessarily performance critical. The key point is that it's not it doesn't need to be distributed for the use case of the application. I just want to distribute it so that it can be close to the user and that it can be optimized that way. The other domain is the, I'm very vaguely calling it the industry application, but this is something that has hard requirements for heterogeneous environments where it's really difficult to deploy an application like this with Kubernetes. And so people end up needing to design it um, from the ground up, running it on their own, like really managing this manually, and it doesn't fit in a cloud native ecosystem when I really think that it could and it should. And to do this, I'm going to use Wasm Cloud. Wasm Cloud is a CNCF sandbox, but hopefully soon to be incubating. We put in that application um, uh, just a few weeks ago. It's application runtime in the CNCF, which is a WebAssembly orchestrator with declarative deployments. It's just a single binary, so you can run it on Linux, Mac, and Windows. We package it in a container. We publish a Helm chart. Um, and really, the, the core goal of the platform is for developers to be able to focus on writing their application, their business logic, the thing that they actually want to write, and not worry about all these platform-specific, essentially, implementation details or things that just take down your productivity and, and drain uh, what you really enjoy doing, which is like just coding, you, writing your application. So we try to abstract things as part of the platform as much as possible. And that includes an application capability model. So instead of working with direct SDKs for things like HTTP servers, key value stores, message brokers, databases, distributed logging, all that stuff, those are all uh, abstract interfaces that you can fill in the implementation at runtime. We also use the CNCF project NATS for all of our networking and RPC um, under the hood. It's actually transparent to the user. Um, but what this means is that I can run my application all on my machine, or I could run it in a multi-cloud, multi-region environment. All of those application components can talk to each other the exact same as if they're running on the same local machine. And that includes load balancing, automatic failover in terms of, in case of an outage, and a really nice abstraction for people who are writing applications. Get down to your business logic, and then everything else is taken care of as part of the platform. Now, so like I said, Wasm Cloud, I've been working on it since about 2019, but it is a cloud-native technology. We use OCI for distributing all of our artifacts. You can just push WebAssembly to OCI repositories. I don't know if you knew that. It's pretty cool. We use the open application model for our declarative manifest, which is an open standard. Cloud events for all of our events that we publish in the system, and we support open telemetry tracing. So this is, this is all really just to say that this integrates really, really well into a cloud-native context. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel with what we're doing, except with this one little thing called WebAssembly. Our unit of compute in Wasm Cloud is not a container. We don't execute containers. Um, Wasm Cloud actually would best fit running inside of a container as far as the platform. But this WebAssembly thing, how many of you, show of hands, have heard of WebAssembly before? 
I'll just keep them up for a second. That's wild. This number keeps getting... Okay, so I talked about WebAssembly at KubeCon in 2019 in San Diego. I don't know how many of you went to that one. That was my first conference. I was talking about this, and I think the number of people at that conference who had heard of WebAssembly was like three. And two of them were me and my colleague who were there talking about it. So it's pretty cool to see that. How many people have actually built and run something at least Hello World style on WebAssembly on the back end? Or front end, whatever, it doesn't matter. Cool. So WebAssembly, if you haven't heard of it or haven't run it, I'll, I'll uh, kind of go through a, a high level of the technology. It's an open standard developed by the W3C. Uh, they say it's the fourth language of the web, uh, which it really is. It, it's supported in all major browsers. And it can also, because it doesn't depend on a specific platform or architecture, run very well on the back end. It's essentially a portable compilation target. So a language that has a WebAssembly uh, compilation support, things like Rust, Go, C, .NET, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, like it, the, the language list continues to grow and grow. Instead of compiling to a native binary, you compile to WebAssembly and then again, execute on a WebAssembly runtime. The WebAssembly runtime is essentially like a virtual machine. It features a essentially deny by default sandbox security model. So everything is denied from the beginning. You have to ask for uh, all the capabilities. Like if you're going to read a file, you have to ask the host runtime if you're allowed to do it. If you're going to make a network request, you have to ask if you're allowed to do it. It's a great and actually as an application developer, not a pain model to work with. It runs at near native speed, and really the thing that you need to take away from this is that it's just a different unit of compute. And we're using WebAssembly to essentially make the developer's life better. It's really nice because it is just a static asset to compile to this compilation target. You can distribute it, and you don't have to worry about what platform you're going to run it on. Now let's start with the hobby application. I cannot for the life of me find this GIF. So if you know about it, please tell me. It was on Reddit at some point, like a three minute GIF of uh, a Seinfeld clip that was, you know, like when they put the fake subtitles over it and that's like what they're saying is saying like, I need my fruit jokes application to be deploying to all these different Kubernetes edge nodes. It needs to serve a request in under three milliseconds. And it's like, Kramer, you're running a fruit jokes application. It's gonna be fine. So that's what I built. It's a nice little hobby application. And to look at the architecture of this in terms of a Wasm Cloud application, I mentioned that we abstract away the capability-driven uh, application capability uh, model. And so it's a, little, uh, it's a little blown up here. But the actual fruit jokes component here is my WebAssembly component. I wrote it in Rust, and it's just in pure business logic. So the HTTP server and the key value store that I'm using to store and access my fruit jokes in the end uh, are something that I get to pick at runtime, uh, which is really nice because I'm just working with an abstraction, and I don't need to worry about the actual implementation that's not compiled into my application. And with this, we're running all these application components in a Wasm Cloud runtime. And if we wanted to distribute this application, you know, my goal, thinking about this, you know, kind of like a CDN, is there are people who are going to want to access and laugh at and enjoy fruit jokes all over the globe at all times. And I want people to do that as fast as possible. Because the Wasm Cloud runtime, it can run on a variety of different targets, and it doesn't have to run in a specific environment, we can distribute that across a bunch of different edge nodes. And that's all kind of interconnected uh, with NATs. We're going to do that using a project that is part of the Wasm Cloud organization called WADM. I love this logo. It's pretty cool. It's the Wasm Cloud Application Deployment Manager. All you really need to know for this talk, I won't, I won't do a deep dive here, but there was a talk on Monday at the WebAssembly, um, the WebAssembly co-located event, all about our engineering effort on this. But all you need to know really is that we're using YAML like everything else, and you can pull the actual application component out of an OCI registry and then use this concept of a daemon scaler, which is like a Kubernetes daemon set, to essentially distribute this piece, uh, this application component across every available node in your Wasm Cloud network, which is all connected with NATs. So let's take a look at it real quick. I'm gonna start by showing you the available pieces of compute in my Wasm Cloud network, and that just means that they're connected together with a NATs server. I have one uh, node, I have one uh, VM that's running in Azure in South Central US. 
I have one that's running in uh, actually on my local MacBook here in the conference. And then I have one that's running in AWS, which is in the US East 2 region. So I've added a couple of different, you know, essentially uh, region-based or location-based nodes to run this application on. And if you take a look at each one, you can see that it's running this Fruit Jokes uh, actor or this WebAssembly component. So let's take a look at what it looks like. If I generate a Fruit Joke here, let's do a cool one. Uh, why did the apple stop in the middle of the road? because it ran out of juice. <laughs> I heard one chuckle and like 14 groans. So I'm gonna do another one. Uh, not that one. Some of these I've actually looked at and they're like, oh, they're not that great. Um, what fruit is never alone? A pear. Okay, slightly more chuckle to groan ratio, so I'm gonna call myself, I'm, I'm gonna stop while I'm ahead there, right? So this is, this is like a, you know, something dumb that you would whip up for fun, it's a hobby application, and the whole uh, idea here is that WebAssembly being a platform agnostic target, um, I get to distribute this around as many different edge nodes as possible. Us being here in the conference, like this node that's running on my local machine, is accessible publicly. But being able to route to this means that people who are accessing this website from this conference are getting the fastest load times possible because I've got this edge node running right here. And that's kind of the, the, the great application of like running, a, running this backend type app like a CDN um, here at, uh, at this conference. So you may be thinking to yourself like, yeah, that was cool. That was a little demo app, right? And it kind of seems like something that could be surge, served by any one of these cloud providers that offer like a CDN, um, probably has something like an edge functions or, or a FAS where you write this little stateless um, serverless function that can serve you a fruit joke and then you call it a day. Like they deal with distributing it around, they've got the whole edge node or whatever. So can't you just do that? Yep. You probably should too. This is really cool to kind of architect with WebAssembly and do with this, but from the developer perspective, it really, the, the, the point or being able to do this with this type of application, you kind of can with like this serverless edge function type of thing. But it doesn't really work for something that's highly distributed or actually has the requirements of running across these different nodes and not just kind of replicated across as many nodes as possible. And so I wanna talk about, I wanna focus on the rest of the talk on this idea of an industry application. Uh, taking the jump with any technology from like a little demo, you know, your hello world to a real world use case, everything gets exponentially more complicated as you do that. And so I made this inventory management application. I came up with some hard requirements, right? These, these things that you may need to do for a real inventory uh, application that aren't really easy to do when you're architecting it in like a, a modern cloud native way, depending on what you do. Here's the requirements. There needs to be a central server, maybe in the cloud, maybe running somewhere uh, for administration, right? The, the whole thing here, and I did a nice little Photoshop here, we're gonna be working on uh, managing the inventory for this paper company. So there's a bunch of different branches that are running across the United States or maybe Europe or whatever. Um, but there's a central server for corporate for to be able to know the inventory of all of the different uh, branches. So they wanna know what's going on. But we're actually gonna be doing deployments on premises in the office location. So there's gonna be a server in the office that you're gonna be running this application on. Really hard requirement. The branches need to be able to operate even if the central network is offline. If you're running a paper company and you're getting calls for orders and you're getting shipments in from the loading dock, that needs to operate even if your Wi-Fi is having a bad day and you're not able to connect to the corporate network. New branches need to be able to add it to the system, be added to the system at any time, and they need to be able to clo close at any time. You know, limitless paper in a paperless world and things happen. So looking at the, looking at how we're gonna do this, this is where Wasm Cloud really starts to shine. This distributed kind of complex requirement use case. The ability to distribute across these different nodes and have everything seamlessly talk to each other as if it's on one machine really lets us create an architecture for this complicated set of, uh, of, of requirements. So this is the full architecture for this application, and I'm gonna go through it uh, piece by piece. 
So in terms of the, uh, the, the central server for administration, the corporate dashboard, some company executive, this is you know, kind of the high level application diagram. Some company executive is going to hit some internal HTTP server with a website and they're going to want to say, hey, how, is all my, how are all my branches doing? Give me a rundown on your inventory. And then we can persist that in a highly replicated data store like Nat's Jetstream, right? So we have our kind of, uh, I think it's actually pretty fair to deploy something like that in the cloud. And then we have our individual uh, branches and that application deployment, the, the piece of application that we need to deploy everywhere is a central management for, you know, essentially a branch manager to uh, process incoming shipments, incoming orders for different types of items, and then store them in a database that's co-located at the actual branch itself. And because we're using NATS, this is actually an aspect that we kind of get for free with NATS, all of the traffic here that's running on the branch will stay local as long as the interested party uh, is, is local. So everything can continue to operate locally here as the, the branch manager can work. So even if you lose connection to a central cluster, you can still process those things. Now, another key requirement was that, you know, we may start with one branch, but we're going to add more and more over time. You know, paper business is booming. We're opening new branches. And so all we need to do is spin up another branch Wasm Cloud runtime, and then we can deploy everything onto that. And again, we're going to do that with the concept of a daemon scaler, like a daemon set. So anytime a new branch pops up in our system, we're going to deploy the entire branch part of the application there, and then we're going to be ready to go. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. I didn't actually deploy this one yet, so let's go ahead and do that now. So I've got my uh, Munder Difflin application here. If we wanted to actually look at the YAML, um, sorry if this is going to make your eyes bleed. You can do JSON if you want to, right? Everybody likes alternatives. We've got all of our different components laid out here uh, using the daemon scaler and all of the relationships and configuration and, and things like that. So if we deploy this application and we go to take a look at our infrastructure that we have running, we can now see that our branch, that's, it's, it's running in Azure, you know, I'm doing it in the cloud because I don't have access to like a real paper thing, um, is now running our branch manager as well as our fruit jokes um, and uh, an HTTP server, our Redis database, our NAS messaging for, for um, passing messaging back and forth, messages back and forth, things like that. Now, if we look at the actual branch, oh, where's my keyboard? If we look at the actual application, so we'll take at how this is all, uh, we'll take a look at how this is all kind of distributed. Give me a second. We can take a look at the corporate dashboard and see what we kind of have currently in our system. So you can see by both of the applications that I created today that I'm very proud of my front end ability to make something rotate in CSS. Everything's going to rotate. Don't worry about it. The way that this works is we can, you know, I'm the person at corporate. I can request a rundown of the pieces of our inventory, and then I can query that from the essentially central cluster. So I've got one branch running in Austin and one running in McCormick. That one is running on my local machine. So the way that this works, if I wanted to act as the branch manager, that branch is running located on my laptop. So I can get some shipments of paper, say 30 pieces of paper, you know, another 35 pieces of paper, things like that. I can request a rundown and I can query the inventory and you can see that from the corporate perspective, I've now gotten my um, 65 pieces of paper. So this is working as expected. Now let's take a look at one of the other hard requirements is that branches need to be added, need to be able to be added at any time. So I'm gonna steal this real quick and I'm gonna go directly SSH into a nice little GCP um, a GCP instance here, and we're going to launch this as our next branch. And so this is just a single command. We use the Wasm Cloud CLI to launch a NATS server and a Wasm Cloud runtime on this branch. And if you take a look, things are happening very quickly. If we take a look at our available infrastructure here, we now have this uh, runtime that's running in GCP uh, in US West, and it is running on an x86 architecture. I like calling all this out, but the cool thing is that you never needed to worry about the architecture or the deployment target anyways. 
You can see that that's automatically loaded up all of our application components because of the declarative application that's saying, hey, spread it across all available branches. And then now on this machine, I can do things like receive shipments of paper, um, or we can even, uh, how does cloud things work? Can I really not go back on this? Okay, I'm gonna handcraft this one to be fun. We can get a nice little order where the item type is paper and the quantity is 10. Sweet, so we got 70 paper into our inventory and then we remove 10. We take a look at the corporate dashboard. We can request a rundown and query, and we can see that the Seattle branch has now popped up with 60 pieces of paper. Woo. So we've been able to uh, you know, essentially validate the requirement to be able to add branches at any time. Now, the really important thing here is that you saw me with my local machine be able to process um, inventory queries. A key requirement is that this needed to be able to work without a network connection to the central cluster. So if I go ahead and turn off my Wi-Fi on my laptop, I'm gonna bring this up for later. Now, I'm not connected to the central cluster at all anymore. So this branch has effectively gone offline. You can imagine they're having some kind of outage or they put the router on top of the microwave and they, you know, whatever. Something happened at the branch, the, the Wi-Fi is no longer working. But the people who are down in the warehouse are still getting shipments of paper and it still needs to work. We need to add, be able to add that to our inventory. Everything needs to be able to process offline. Um, now I'm doing, um, I'll do kind of a, a larger amount so that the amount is obvious. Eventually, they're gonna be able to resolve that issue. We're gonna be able to turn the Wi-Fi back on. The central, uh, the central corporate cluster is going to understand uh, that we've gone offline for a small period of time and then and come back up. So you saw everything working locally. When we get back to the actual inventory, you can see that if we just try to query it, the corporate dashboard, the, the corporate um, database hasn't caught up all the way. But we can make a request to our um, different, uh, or you can make a request back to this thing that's running on the local machine, and we'll give it a second to fully like register interest again. Uh -huh. It hasn't actually fully reconnected yet. We'll give it a second with uh, all the Wi-Fi. I'm actually running off of my hotspot, so I wonder if that's messing with everything here. Okay, there we go. Hmm. What? Uh, well, let's see. We're working at the McCormick branch. Unless that number was already, was that already included in the thing? Hmm. I guess the demo gods aren't with us today. That is unfortunate. Well, here, we'll give it a minute. I'll give you a little bit of the, the post sample and then we'll come back here and see what's going on. So let's go ahead and move forward and talk about what is all of this good for? Like running with WebAssembly, running with Wasm Cloud, what, like what scenarios is this great for? It's really great for distributed data locations, like running in these different edge nodes, these different individual branches, the heterogeneous environments that can be added to or removed at any time, any application that's network constrained, like the vast majority of the time to process is the network request and anything that you are interested in doing multi-region or multi-cloud deployments. This is completely platform and vendor agnostic, so it's a really great application for uh, spreading across multiple regions or clouds. Things that don't necessarily work as well in Wasm Cloud, you know, things that have perfect support for, but with WebAssembly, um, these little single component applications, the web front ends, kind of like our fruit jokes, it works fine, um, but can be better elsewhere. And then for WebAssembly itself, it's an abstraction of a CPU. You know, it's running with an instruction set that's not OS or architecture specific. So if you're doing Linux specific things, like things that you're, like you're inspecting syscalls to come out of a system, uh, you probably aren't gonna wanna run it with an abstraction layer. It doesn't really make sense uh, in terms of the, uh, the benefit of the technology. And what does this all really mean? When you're running WebAssembly, you can run your applications anywhere platform and OS agnostic. 
And when you run Wasm Cloud, you can orchestrate those WebAssembly applications, and that allows them to all talk to each other the same, no matter how they're distributed across different clouds and edges, uh, even your local laptop. Now what's next? I think I can improve this demo a little bit. I think the, we could use a management UI instead of curling in the terminal, but it's always nice to you know, bring that back to reality. We can move fruit jokes to the front end. But what I really love to see for this is deploying Wasm on the device. I would love to run this platform agnostic target in the browser like the technology can. And I'd like to have kind of a more data first class caching solution. So, you know, I'm clicking in the UI to kind of get updates on the system, uh, but I like to do that in a more, a more first class way. You know what? I'm kind of upset that this, uh, let me check this out. There we go. There it is. We got our, got our nice little update. I knew that, that, knew that that would come through. Thank you so much. <laughs> gotta be patient, uh, gotta be patient. So uh, I'd love to, you know, we got a couple minutes here, but I really just want to leave these up on the, on the screen. I would love it if you were interested in the things today, if you want to pop in our community Slack, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll answer some here and you can find me after the talk, but um, that's where all the maintainers hang out. Uh, we like to have a good time. We run weekly community meetings on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then all of our code, all the things that you saw here, the capabilities are in our open source repo uh, in GitHub, um, the whole Wasm Cloud organization, including like the deployment manager and all that is there. So it looks like I do have a couple more minutes. So any questions? Um, in your demo, I think you said in the branch you're running Redis. Like what is, what is Redis running on? Like how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm running, so the, the specific piece of the application here, so the, the branch, the, the Redis that I'm running, there is an actual Redis server that's running just like on the virtual machine there, like on GCP, for example. And this component here on the right side, the Redis, is the implementation of the key value capability. So when I, in my application, I have a couple gits and set ads and things, but that's an abstract contract. You'll notice actually on the, the corporate dashboard, it uses the same abstraction to interact with NATs. It's just at runtime, I get to pick what data store to use. And so that Redis that's running on the branch is kind of like a connector to that, to that database. Other questions? All right, well, thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna be hanging out for a little bit after the talk and then eventually probably move into the hallway track, but really appreciate you coming out and listening to me do some, some dumb fruit jokes and some cool demos today.